Jordan Belfort made his initial fortune on penny stocks. We got two great movies out of this, Boiler Room and The Wolf of Wall Street. His strategy was fairly simple, it was a pump and dump. These are penny stocks because they're commonly very low cost shares that don't trade on regular exchanges, but rather on an over the counter market. In a classic PND, a promoter buys up a bunch of shares, which then ups the price. Then they use that increase in price as a proof of concept. Once the rush is on, a promoter can then easily offload the bags to unsuspecting investors. You can make a tidy profit if you time it right. Jordan would have his associates aggressively cold call and through use of clever scripting and tactics, they would convince others these were solid investments. Just happened to help that uh, they sold from their own inventory. The firm would almost always take a nice profit, but the other end of that deal, oh, the pesky other end, much more often than not translated into economic disaster. All the shares were then dumped, and the truth behind all of it eventually does come out. Pump and dumps have always been a part of the stock market. Back in the day, though, it was almost considered the cost of doing business. Enough about the Wolf of Wall Street. For today's lesson, let's instead talk about the Jackal. Let's chat about mining, shall we? Not the crypto of this century, but the rare metals of the last two. The mining stock frauds of railroads and mining companies of the 18th and 19th century. Dan Plastic's book, A Hole in the Ground with a Liar at the Top, is a great read. Also, really nice title. To set the board. Railroads were a prime example of how big money, high tech industries and investors of their day played the game. One needed capital in order to purchase rights of way, lay track, and order locomotive parts. This was the big table. In contrast, in contrast though, was the industry of mining that allowed for a much lower entry point. And one had the potential to strike it rich this might be true as a miner or as a stockholder. Any person could really stake a claim. All you needed were a few tools. Even the maximum investment needed for your average mine would pale in comparison to what the big boys were paying to enter their railroad game. Okay, so we have low cost startup, small barrier to entry with lots of interest. This translates into hundreds of mining companies that were founded. The upside potential was usually higher as well. From a small shareholder perspective, if your mine hit a rare metal, then your profits would skyrocket. There was no such lotto chance with the railroads. Everything in life really is a bet. Experience brings better odds, but luck is an equal mistress in all things. We thank you, Lady Luck, whoever, whatever you are. We ask that you look over us and our tendies. One good and solid mine was all it would really take, similar to the dot-com bubble, really. You could bet on all of them a little bit, and your odds were, well, they were. Your odds felt better. Math matters. Oftentimes, the gut matters more, though. All of this perfected the storm that was the mining surge. Geology tech was pretty decent for the time, but they still couldn't tell you if gold, silver, or really anything specific was in your mine. We live in a universe of ordered randomness. None of this should really surprise us, but it does have a way of drawing in a very diverse crowd. Retail trading, anyone? So then, with low startup costs and seemingly endless upside. Think GameStop calls back when it was under 20. This had the potential to moon written all over it. Quick reminder, gang, Elon totally owes us a rocket. 
failing in a mine a few times wasn't really about skill. This luck element at the forefront added a unique flavor to the game. You might be one bad mine away from the golden one. In the 19th century, Ophir Mines worked silver ore in Nevada. It was the Google and Apple of its day. Now that most of these companies tended to form in the towns where the boom occurred. It made it tricky to get new investors. But, much like life, the market finds a way. Their local stock exchanges were limited, so they'd reach the larger public like this. First, they would list shares on a big city exchange. It gave them a dash of legitimacy. By the way, real quick, I don't see Dash doing much these next few months. What's that, Didi? People want out of their caves, and getting food is a great excuse. Fair point. Welcome back to You've Made Worse Bets, coming to you from the Great Bull Cave. I am your host, CJ. Over my shoulder, telling me about a great opportunity out west that is almost assuredly free money is the esteemed due diligence. He's a bear, and we are a gambling show. Really, that covers everything in life, so let's get to the list. JKS, solar play that's stupidly undervalued. Check out every chart it has. I'll save you the time. It's mega dip territory the whole way across. It inked a deal for a huge module supply and is one of the few that got rated with satisfactory results in the entire space. Bullish AF, do not wait too long on these. Also, it's a very solid long. GM, a two day big money pattern. Here's the interesting thing mid size retail buy to sell is over a 10 to 1 ratio. The boomer stocks are back in play, gang. GameStop, what else do I really need to say? To the moon. OCGN. The lack of big money is actually what interests me here. It hasn't moved out all week from heavy investment last week. This tells me that someone is expecting a big bump this week or next. I'd get these early. Cron. There is a no big money to speak of in the last five days. It's all mid-range retail here. Buying and selling is a nice margin difference. Wait for a good dip on this one. There should be one if you're patient. Also, nice dip on the one month. Grow, uh, big money three day pattern. If you have a weed play, disregard, but I'm not doing my usual current this week. Instead, I'm switching to grow. I see more growth potential in the short term. PDD, good dip on the five day and the one month. If big money were my indicator here, it would actually be to stay away. There's been a mass exodus these past couple of days. It had a nice bump yesterday though. I'd wait for a dip. There should be a healthy one sometime today. I'd go a few weeks out on these. You made worse bets. Six, full disclosure, share, season passes. I love Six Flags. This is the lowest point you're going to see Six Flags all year, I'm betting. Volume might be not be there in the morning, but all the big money that moved out last week moved back in Monday. Only a fraction of it moved out yesterday. Bullish AF. Back to the jackal. The main city to trade in, if it wasn't New York, was San Francisco. They were happy to get the commissions from all the trading, so they didn't really have a huge incentive to set too high a standard. Once listed, they would then launch PR campaigns. They'd promote their sale of shares in the paper. The original post of, I like the stock, if you will. Nowadays though, before a company can even be listed, they must launch what's called a prospectus. This is the opposite of advertising. The SEC requires that you essentially take the opposite of why it is a good position. It must zero in on all the known risks and harms. It's a legally binding document. Now before the 1930s, before the 30s, there was no SEC. 
Okay, so they're not the best, but more people will get screwed without them. True story. Back to mining. Advertisements back in the day were constantly speaking about how you'd more than likely strike it rich. Here, just ask these selfless shareholders who are just trying to be honest brokers. For just a few months' wages, even you can bag, <coughs> uh, invest in your future. The game never changes. Our understanding of it, though, if we're paying attention, does. So all these papers, all of them had technical reports. These are exactly what you think they are. They didn't convince anyone, per se, but companies would also pay local reporters to perhaps mention specific mines. Some were even paid in mining company shares. Hashtag teamwork. A writer by the name of Sam Clemens wrote a book about all of this. It was called Roughing It. Twain defined a mine as a hole in the ground with a liar on top. Someone should really like use that for a title of a book. It's good. It was all a simple formula. The better the liar, the more shares you could sell while continuing to rise the price. And if you knew what you were doing, everyone on the inside could become super wealthy. Once again, it would not have the same effect on the other side of the deal. For a winner, there must be a loser. There was no better liar in the game than George Graham Rice. Not his real name. Born Jacob Simon Hersig, from a young age, he decided he was much more fond of gambling than working. A decent forger forge his father's signature to pay for his travels and various gambling debts. That is, until his family finally had him arrested and sent him to Sing Sing for five years. He studied his craft well there, and he exited as GGR, as George Graham Rice. After his first release, Rice started a company that offered betting tips on horse racing, and he started a mail-order gambling business. In order to help keep these costs low, he even bought a defunct newspaper and wrote many of its stories. He liked to libel the celebrities of his day as well. As such, a lawsuit would eventually shut down his paper, and the Postal Service, the Postal Service, would put an end to his uh, mail-order betting business. $200 in his pocket, he decided to head west to try to make his fortune. In San Fran, he met an old prison buddy who told him to go to a boom town in Nevada. Turns out it was not sage advice. George was actually duped into being a bag holder by his friend. He decided to run with it. He was born for this. Not the mining stuff, mind you. That, that stuff looks hard. But instead, his true calling was to be a stock promoter. Rice built a highly profitable mining business in six months. Much like Samuel Clemens, he also took mine stock as payment. Unlike Mark Twain, though, he actually made money. That's a story for maybe tomorrow. He was just better at it than all around him. When a new gold venture was started in the Bullhorn Hills of Nevada, George was called in by the owners. They offered him shares and land for his maximum effort. Something about the vagueness of that description that I personally love. Charles Schwab was the former president of U.S. Steel and was the current one for Bethlehem Steel. He was interested in some property. And so he invested. I mean, there was a gold vein after all, but it was thin. It was actually a quite clever con. The developers, developers had dug the mine parallel to the gold mine, rather than cutting across it, which was the acceptable way. This gave the impression that the vein was much larger than it was. Chucky fell for it, and he ridiculously overpaid. He didn't just get swindled, though. He brought along some rich friends for the ride. They all got shares. Jackal, George on the other hand, netted about $30,000. 
1906, the Great Quake shut down the San Francisco Stock Exchange. When it finally reopened, George staged an event. He concocted the story that a prospector had made a huge strike out in Death Valley. And here's the kicker. That he would sell his shares for the first reasonable offer that could reach him in time. George raced out in a brand new car to find the prospector before Schwab and his rich pals could reach him and snake the deal. Okay, so we have no record of any of this. What we do have, what we do have, is the fact that several papers nearby ran with the story. It had a happy ending, with George getting the gold before that fat cat, Schwab. Stories matter more than facts, especially in the short term. The big money, the big money, stealing and mining stocks directly. As such, George founded a trust. So then he could do the marketing for it as well. He did have mines. They were hot garbage, but they existed. His promotion scheme allowed him to pump and dump on the novices and some big money as well. In a famous fight, that was promoted to draw investors to Nevada. There was a 42 round bout, a lightweight match between Joe Gant, a black fighter, who was defending his title against Oscar Nelson, a white fighter. Labor Day, 1906, Goldfield, Nevada. It drew thousands, both in people and in capital. Nat Goodwin, one of the most popular funny men at the time, was convinced to be a figurehead for the film. Meanwhile, George would manage from the board of directors. It was his platform for the biggest pump and dump yet. Nevada had just seen a gold stock rise. Rawhide coalition mines, rather than be on a local market, though he wanted to go bigger. The New York Curb Exchange, literally on Broad Street, on the curb side of the stock exchange itself an outdoor, over-the-counter market, buying and selling with really anyone who was willing to trade. All of this was actually well and good until the town of Rawhide burned down. There wasn't enough water to drink, let alone put out a fire. George was not hampered by any of this. He told investors, the gold didn't burn. It's still there, and people are already rebuilding. He also started an ad campaign that looked exactly like news articles. So in his fake news, his experts would advise that 25 cents would grow to $2 in a few weeks and $6 in a few months. He pushed these shares hard and they were above a buck and rising right before they could hit that $2 mark though. A legit mining publication, the Mining and Scientific Press, published an accurate evaluation and identified uh, all these properties as being, what's the word, como se llama, worthless. George bought in at 15 cents a piece and he sold right around $1.40. This would be his reputation into the big game. He was finally a big player. He also went to prison a few times, cost of doing business, I suppose. In 1909, he had a new company that put out mining newsletters to stimulate interest in mining stocks. He hired an army of sales reps to work the phones. They were called Dynamiters. With George at the helm, this bucket shop would promote garbage, take money and not buy shares, as well as manipulate the prices for the stocks that they actually did own. Um, not the best moves in the world, but uh, they were brokers with no real connection to the exchanges. The patrons here just buy stuff in name only and bet for a rise and fall. A shady operator where one might just draw it randomly out of a bucket for that day or just make stuff up. They also sent out tip sheets through the mail. The US mail does not play. You think you'd have learned from the last time we are creatures of habit, after all. He pled guilty to mail fraud, and he got a whole year in prison. As soon as he was out, he found a new bucket shop. 
Might be a story for another time, but really his life was just a few cycles of this over and over and over. In jail, or making millions, there was no in-between for him. In 1916, he saw that some, someone was promoting, like a stock he was promoting, was being shorted. And that they were actually shorting more shares than existed. It's comforting to know sometimes history repeats. Eventually, at some point, all shorts must sell and return those shares. Mr. Rice bought up all the shares, trapping the brokers, and then he refused to sell. He let the price skyrocket to outrageous levels. Then he sold. In 1925, he paid nine cents a share for a defunct company that owned bad South Dakota mines. He made up a story that the mine had been discovered by the Incas, and that it was full of emeralds, and that he would pump water into the mine and float them to the surface. Old school fracking. They traded on the Boston Curve Exchange. It went to $17 a share before he cashed out. And he went to prison for another four years. This time, he had Al Capone as a cellmate. In 48, it closed in on his last bucket shop. They missed him by moments. He went into hiding, really a few blocks away, until his death in 53. He swindled $500 million. That's six billion today. Belfort made 200 million in the 90s. The jackal and the wolf. It's a jungle out there. Today, gang. Don't be let off course by a promise of easy money. Short-term gains are not offset by long-term risk. Patience pays after all. Ready up, bulls. We're gonna ride the momentum of the dream of a better tomorrow. And we'll start mining hard early in the morning, right around first light, right around dawn.